この番組はご覧のスポンサーの提供でお送りしますオーライディ、ウェルカム、エブリワン、アイム、ティアブー、アイム、ヒア、フォー、フリーラン、エピソード、セヴン、タイムス、トゥー、ビカス、アクシュリー、エピソード、フォーティーン、アイドン、ノワイ、アイディダブ Last time on Free Ren, we met one character named Sign, and I've come to really like him. I spent today listening to the Prince album Sign of the Times as a kind of、uh, way of it felt right. And I just have to, to mention I think Prince is a very good artist, and I really like his music. Yeah. I also really like Sign, and I'm curious about why. I've spent the last week really kind of trying to dive in and think about this mild paradox. The paradox that I see is that people who you meet who are、mm, convinced of their own goodness are very often, often bad fucking people. Whereas the people that you meet who are convinced of their own badness are very often some of the best people that you'll ever meet. This is a, a curious paradox that people's opinions of themselves seem to go in kind of opposite directions of reality. I've spent some time thinking about it, and I'd love to hear your theories about why this might be the case. But I've, I've come to the conclusion that when you meet someone and they're choosing how they'll present themselves, a manipulative person will present themselves as good. An honest person will present themselves relatively honestly. And I think one of the Overlooked traits of goodness that makes a person actually good in my mind is the ability to recognize the bad parts of them by whatever scale or metric they're running on, right? Whatever socially incorporated or not, or innate or whatever, religious, however you want to view it, whatever things they see as bad, they're able to recognize those. And then actively pursue ridding themselves of them, or at the very least making some kind of peace with them, or knowing that they're there and working around them, or anything like that. Whereas the tendency of a creature that, and I say creature because we've had both humans and non humans that exhibit these traits in the Free Ren universe, a creature that is not good. Is very likely to see themselves as good and avoid recognizing their bad traits as such, either purely avoiding, to re- avoiding recognizing them, something that humans do all the time, or converting those and saying that those are in fact virtues themselves and are things that they should lean into and are actually good. So, what's the takeaway? Well, I think. I don't think I need to tell you this. I think you already know it innately, and that's the interesting part. If you meet someone and their presentation of self is flawless, spotless, and good, be suspicious. And if you meet someone and their presentation of self is honest, maybe even to the point beyond self deprecation to actually like being kind of mean to themselves, That might be a strong indicator that they are actually and actively good, capable of recognizing the parts of themselves that they don't like, maybe actively working against those, or at the very least, recognizing themselves as a human, as a, a person, an entity caught between light and darkness, manifest of shadow stuff and glowy stuff at the same time. I think if any person spends a lot of time investigating their own mind, their own capacity, their own reality, they'll come to the realization that there are some parts of them that are dark. And whether you want to view that, those as the Jungian shadow or the animal instinct or whatever perspective you choose to take, those Parts of you that you recognize are going to force a reaction from you of some kind. You have to engage with them to some extent. And one of the modes of engagement is to run away and pretend they don't exist. And I talk about this pretty on- often on the channel. When you pretend that your darkness doesn't exist, it gets stronger. When you push it away and press it down and squeeze onto it and try to control it, it squeezes out the sides. And so the person who maybe even believes. Themselves to be deeply good, who presents that face to the world is very often hiding a twisted face underneath, a darkness that they don't want to look in the mirror. So, 
Again, the takeaway might be if you meet someone and their record seems spotless, maybe be suspicious. Whereas if you meet someone and they seem to have done some internal work to recognize the flaws inherent to their being, maybe don't be so suspicious. And the person who I think embodies this most poignantly in our show so far, though that place may be taken over by sign as we meet and learn about him, the person who most exhibits those traits is Heiter. Heiter is a character whose active actions throughout the show, his real important moves, have been deeply good. Deeply good. Pretty much every line that he says is influential in a potently positive way. He is a literal healer and priest, right? Maybe not a very believing one, but he does believe to an extent that's valuable, while also recognizing the potential flaws in his belief. Similar to his perspective on self, his perspective on religion isn't that it's perfect. It's not that it's necessarily completely true or, or broadly important or whatever or, 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 or gloriously the answer to everything. Instead, it's a very human perspective, a very real one, a belief that it would be better if it were this way. And he seems to really hold on to that, maybe in a way that puts to shame the... <sighs> the near fanatical required perfect belief that we see in many religious people in reality and in fiction, this unwillingness to dispense with any piece of the theology because it would make the whole house of cards tumble down, Heider doesn't seem like that. He seems willing to take the losses and the flaws and the failures of the religion along with it. And similarly to his real life. His real important actions, adopting a child and caring for her for a long period of time with great sincerity, going on a selfless mission to save the world, those things fly in the face of the other things that he does and presents himself as, a drunk and a fool, maybe even a, a, a bit of a womanizer, you know, any of these traits that he kind of leans into make him oddly far more trustworthy even if they are against what he should be doing as a priest, I think we understand innately that the things that a priest should be doing are inhuman. They're not quite right. It's a little bit weird to be a person who completely divests yourself of desire. And, well, when we turn our attention to the real world, we find a lot of people who've put on those vestments and with them a mask to the world that hides great darkness within. So, so often it seems, the people who have a deeply vested interest in presenting themselves as good are not, and the people who are willing to own up to their mistakes are actually good. Curious. And something I think worth thinking about, and, um looking at the real world with that as a lens. For example, look at politicians. There is a wide variety here. There are a lot of politicians who try to keep a perfect immaculate record, and a lot of them end up having weird scandals about them, like really strange things that kind of don't go along with their outward persona at all. Whereas when you look at Individuals who are a little bit more open and honest with their failures and flaws, who have perhaps come from darkness or overcome something difficult in their lives, very often they seem to have their shit together in a more serious way. Maybe because they've actually faced down hardship, or maybe because there's something dramatically different about the kinds of people who are willing to admit their faults in front of others. There's something about that willingness to admit, admit fault in front of others that makes you endearing trustworthy even. How cool is that? A person who comes up to you and says, yeah, I don't know if you can trustworthy, if you can trust me, is probably far more trustworthy than the person who comes up to you and says, oh, you can trust me. Which one of those people do you trust? The one who's like, I'm not sure if I can do this task that you've assigned to me, but I'll give it my best shot. Or the one who goes, I got it, no problem. I think inherently we're going to trust the I got it no problem person, but I think if you take a step back, the person who recognizes that flaws might be possible is going to be much better for the purpose. I saw this a lot 
when I was working with my dad doing construction or uh, maintenance on houses. We would come in and often we'd be the second people that people would call. They'd get a contractor or a group or a company or something to come and remodel their bathroom. And the company would come and they'd be like, yeah, we got it. No problem. It'll be great. No, no sweat. And they'd do everything wrong. Like all of it not to code, wires loose, like terrible shit, a tile fucked, just terrible shit. And we'd come in and my dad always had this same perspective. He'd go, well, I'll give it my best shot, but I'm not sure. And we lost business a couple times because people went, so you're not going to guarantee 100% that the, no, I'm not sure what's going to be behind this wall when I tear it, once I tear it open. I can't give you an estimate for an hour's work because once I tear this wall open, there's the distinct possibility that the entire wall is full of mold and that I'm going to have to strip all the plumbing out, all the drywall out and really do some work here. So, no, I'm not going to tell you you can trust me and I'll give you a lowball budget. I'm going to tell you the truth. And so often the people, business people working with their reputation on the line would say, we got it and then fuck it up. Or, like, fighters. I've been watching UFC fighters for a little while, and it's funny to me how often the good boys, the ones who put on a presentation or, or an act of being nice, normal guys, are actually monsters. Jones. Um, just say John Jones. Are actually monsters. Whereas the ones who are like, yeah, I like getting in the ring and actually fucking people up, um... Or who even take on the act of a uh, a heel persona actually have something more interesting going on in the background, or you know, fighting to support their family and have a have a real level going on. It seems like the people who are willing to admit their faults are at a baseline more grounded, more in tune with who they really are, and I think that means more capable of directing themselves. I would say controlling themselves, but directing themselves seems more accurate. And choosing how to act, being aware of their flaws in a way that allows them to rein them in, whereas those who seem unaware of their flaws continue to be unaware of those flaws as they act them out. And that's very scary. So, all of this is kind of up in the air and hasn't really come to a conclusion of any sort. Maybe it will in the future, with our characters spending more time together, Maybe it won't, but I wanted to talk about this because Sign set me on this path of thinking about how people present themselves and what that means about what's going on inside, behind the mask that they wear. Maybe it's as simple as saying that those people who present themselves as both dark and light are wearing a thinner mask. Probably not none at all. Don't think any of us go around without a mask, but maybe a thinner one. Maybe less porcelain doll and more, you know, a thin veil that protects them and others from them while revealing the truth underneath if you look carefully enough. Anyway, a cool train of thought sparked by a cool show that we're going to watch another cool episode of. Thanks so much for joining me for this next episode of Free Ren. We're watching episode 14. I expect good things. I remember something fiddly at the end that seemed to be like banter between Stark and Fern that makes me think that maybe we won't be totally dispensing with the potential for romance among these two youthful creatures who are uh, entirely unaware of the, <laughs> their potential attraction to each other and uh, one of whom projects very strongly her their her <laughs> her perversions on the other. Um quite curious. I don't know. But I'm looking forward to watching more of the show because, once again, we haven't had a failure yet. We haven't had even a dip yet. We haven't had a flaw. We haven't had a problem. <sighs> We've just been consistently interesting. Consistently, consistently interesting. And last week's episode dealing with reluctance and the desire to adventure and the little push that was needed was no exception. Another beautiful piece. So I'm going to do a quick drawing, and then we're going to watch an episode of Free Ren and enjoy our Wednesday. Onward to drawing. Okay, so I'm going to do this vertical. I did, I sketched this out initially horizontal. I want to do, now that we, I think, have our party together, I want to do all four symbols of the party 
um in one thing and this is not it like this isn't the way that it should be organized just because the way that the pieces are but stark's axe fern's staff the symbol of the goddess and uh Freeren's staff as well so i'm gonna give this a shot and it's gonna go like this i'm gonna mishmash fern and Freeren's staves together <laughs> And then this is wrapped here. I wonder what this symbol actually is. Because it's 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 wings, right? But is it a winged scroll? Is that what it is? I think it's a winged scroll. Cool. That's that's about it. Maybe I'll do a little a little cleanup here. A little cleanup. Get a little crispy. And that's that. Okay. I think that's pretty neat looking, even if it's not totally coherent. I do think I like this style of a design better, where it's like rooted in the center more. Because I chose to mix Fern and Freerun's staves here, it kind of muddles. So the lines don't don't end up as crisp as they could be. Eh, I don't care. I don't care. I'm, I'm intrigued. And with that, and now... We're ready to roll. Free Ren episode 7 times 2 equals 14. Up and ready to go. Sitting at 0 seconds. There will be two versions. Picture and picture in the description. Timer on the YouTube. Beep beep timer to count you down. Early access on the Patreon. And a beep beep timer to count you down. Let's get into it. Rad region. Hey, a nice town. Oh, he's so tall. Mmm. So we've been here before. Dato. It's a Dato. Betsuni Kedo. Baka the Baka Baka Baka. Baka Baka the Baka Baka. Just wearing a dunce cap that is actually the tower. I love it. <laughs> That's my favorite scene. Just wearing a tower top. <laughs> and then the best part. Oh, just kidding. Now's the best part. Is that a marimba? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Privilege of the young. <laughs> oh shit. What do you do, Fern? Yes. <laughs> what did you do, Fern? <laughs> oh. Does he know that it's her birthday? Did, 
Did he? T did she tell him? <laughs> Yeah, but she cares about Stark caring. <laughs> da, die, ankle. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, he's still, still, still weak. <laughs> Just gonna explode out the ears. <laughs> the bracelet. Yeah. She did it for you, so. Hesitated. That's cute. It does. Hey. Ah. Uh. Yes, it is. <laughs> You're just lazy. Doing a lot of focus on this hand. It's almost uh, Yamada esque. Naoko Yamada esque. And take it a step further. Aww. Yeah, don't attribute to malice what can be attributed to stupidity. But there is a reciprocity element. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. You are so out of touch, Fern. <laughs> Completely out of touch with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Also, that might last until until middle age or beyond, just to throw enough there. Yeah! Fuck, thank you! People won't know how you feel until you tell them. <sighs> Mind reader! Mind reader! People can't read minds. Gotta be explicit. Hello? Again, with the feet stuff and the hands and the... It's really Yamada-esque. I don't know how else to put it. Sorry to do comparative and... Oh, shit. What I was saying before! Okay, you overthought. You overthought. Are we actually going to be able to become communicative uh, allies? <laughs> Acquaintances? Not enemies? Shopping. I fully almost expected her to take his arm for some reason. I know that she wouldn't ever, but, like, weirdly, I expected it. Aww. Huh. 
<sighs> Do you? <laughs> That's a cute. Yeah, she does not understand. It's three kids. There you go. <laughs> it's just three siblings. That's because she doesn't trust her. Not with advice. She sees Heiter in you. Yeah. <laughs> I think that cut killed me. <laughs> Just. Mm -hmm. No denial. Yeah, weird. It's so I'm so glad I talked about what I talked about at the beginning of this. I'm so glad. <laughs> That's super true too. Yeah, welcome to the world. Fucking ultra true. <sighs> Finally, somebody says it. Yeah, but the grown ups are just children on the inside anyway. So gods are to children, uh, gods are to adults what adults are to children. Wow. But she might as well be a god to you. Oy yo. <gasps> lewd, 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 lewd. Lewd. But beautiful. It's not bad. Hey, we'll meet you there, man. <laughs> Get your hands off my head. <laughs> this coming from you, child. The animation on that is gorgeous. The little bits falling out the cigarette. <laughs> she is an older woman! Ooh. Ooh. Ow! It's pretty pretty. It's a pretty 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 bracelet. Now they've got matching bracelets. Matching bracelets. Almost like rings. Are you now? Accessories like rings and and bracelets? You are a good salesman. Good job. I think she's all full up. <laughs> Birthday present. Yeah, it is really similar, isn't it? Did he now? Uh huh. Did he put it? Happen to put it on the left ring finger? <laughs> Did you happen to lose it? Free run. We was just there. We saw it last episode. Okay. What? No, the ring. To a flashback. What happened? What was that? 
<laughs> Horsey! Horsey! No. Wow, flying magic's only been around for 40. Honestly, not that surprising. That's cool. No, we can't make the carriage fly. Oh shit, we can't even manipulate it. So we could jump out and fly individually. Yeah. And, uh, me? And Stark? Excuse me? Hello? Just jump? <laughs> <laughs> now you're a warrior! Now you're a warrior! We saw what you did to the dragon. <laughs> oh. Is he a cat? Any height? Straight into the fucking skull. Bro doesn't have enough brain cells <laughs> to get brain damage. What the fuck? Yeah, Ison was was built different. Maybe it's dwarven anatomy. No, no, just let it fall and jump. You'll be fine. <laughs> so casual. Yeah, with the background dropped out. Oh! Oh no! Oh yeah! <laughs> I mean, that'll do! I guess we're falling now. Worth a shot! It better work, free run! <laughs> What a fun scene. I love it. I absolutely love it. Truly a- Oh! We levitated the horse! We saved the horse! Did she just levitate the horse so that it pulled the whole thing up? A little bit? Beautiful. Good horsey. Oh. Yeah, whatever. No, that was our lives, man. Is the ring missing? Oh, that's gorgeous. Oh my god. <laughs> the ring is missing. Uh, uh. <sighs> oh my god, it's like choosing where to eat. It's awful. That's awful. Don't do that to your SO. Or to anybody. Just don't do- You should! Let this be a lesson. He doesn't. That's okay. They do, do they? And, uh... Hemel gave one to Fur Freeren. The language of flowers, Hanakotoba, huh? Something also that Hemel would definitely know. Given his love of flowers and making flower crowns and... Knowing names of flowers and stuff. 
No, she wants it. He's not going to turn down your eternal love. <laughs> ah, you children. <laughs> Cute. So that means that he will give Freerun the... As a ring, too. Which hand? Which finger? Does that matter in this world? It matters in this one. Jesus, we fucking killed that thing and ate the entire thing. Oh, wow. Blanket free run. <laughs> Just holding it up. Gotta love having a strong character. Good as new! Oh, she's out looking for the ring. She's looking for anything that shines in the light. So this is her last chance to find it. It's not like it's important or anything. It's Daimus. It's not like it matters that much or anything. I bet he knew. <laughs> And she's like, it's not that important, I'll just leave it. But it's that important. A spell for finding lost accessories? It's air tag for your earrings? Let's that's dope! I want that. Do you know how many times I would find my keys? <laughs> Fuck! Oh my god. Just the other week, I lost my keys for like two days. It was miserable. Where are you, my love? Where are you? Oh, here we are. Oh, so it was on the way back. <laughs> oh, she just grabbed one at random. He didn't choose it. No, he did choose it after the fact. He recognizes the Hanakotoba of it. He knows what it means. Oh, oh, oh! I have wanted this spell for my entire life. I've wanted this spell for my entire life. Oh, do it proper, bud. Oh, do it proper, bud. Oh, he's down on the knee. Oh, my God. Oh, that's the left hand. Oh, that's the ring finger on the left hand. That has no, no fiddle room for wiggle. <laughs> no wiggle room for fiddling about. That's what it means, baby. That means one thing and one thing only. Yo! Yo! Can't complain about that. <laughs> yeah, It's just a ring. It doesn't matter or anything. <laughs> 40,000 year old tsundere. Hmm. That's a good answer. <laughs> you toy! How mean. Yeah! Yeah! What a, what a baller episode. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> if 
fifty percent of the episode is Fern just. <laughs> Oh, this one, this one is maybe the most full of subtle character animation. There's no jacket scene where it's like, whoa, but every bit of hair and every little motion is just like, it's, it's overwhelming how the baseline quality of this show is so high. It's just overwhelming. Okay, little little something something. His brother's talent. Maybe Stark. Smells like trouble. Cool. I want trouble. I knew you were trouble when you. I don't want to reference Taylor. Please, God. Oh, God, stay away. Stay. Ah, yeah, they're coming. The Swifties. Dead. Okay. I really like this episode. It's. Uh, kind of perfect for interpersonal stuff. It takes a slower pace than some of our others and focuses a lot on pretty meticulously presented dialogue. About half the episode is Fern going, <laughs> which I am a big, fa big fan of, and the other half is just pure intrigue. No big action scenes in this one, with I suppose the exception of Freerun jumping out of a flying carriage to shoot down a giant bird, which I suppose counts as a cool action scene. But striking to me over the course of the episode was the subtle character animation all the way through. Just careful and, more importantly, indicative of internal emotions maybe not being expressed intentionally. I said multiple times, at least in the first couple minutes of the episode, this reminds me of Naoka Yamada, the, the, uh, the director with the most distinctive focus on feet and hands and limbs and articulation to represent internal character emotional state and i think the best understanding of how to evoke emotional experience in us watching other characters i don't know of anybody who's quite as good at that as naoko yamada and the works that she's directed this feels like it's in that vein which is really interesting to me and makes me tempted to go and look up the character, like the, the episode director and stuff for this episode before we even dive into it. And I might. But I do kind of want to dive in first. At least get to one or two things that I want to stop and talk about. But from stopping suddenly to realize that this is a familiar place with a giant dunce cap on her head. To Fern's later... And, and fist clench and stamping feet and things um individual character interactions are great would it kill her to listen to me once in a while but we're also forging our party's identity we've had to do this again each time that we've brought a new character into the party and now i think sign is probably our last major addition and for good reason and he brings something totally new free run is old but not wise doesn't quite fit right? I'd put Free Ren as like high end, low wisdom. Um, doesn't seem very materially capable of real world things or insight on other people. Heiter and now Sign are actually wise like that. And despite maybe his womanizing tendencies that Fern kind of calls him out for, uh, Sign is more familiar with people. That's a way to put it. Is more familiar with people in general and is able to take this um, fatherly kind of role because he is a little bit older than both Stark and Fern. Maybe it's less a father's role and more an older brother's role. That seems to fit a little bit better. It doesn't feel like a, a, a surrogate mother, surrogate father. It feels like inept big sister who's actually really competent at some things and capable 
older brother who's got flaws at some things as well. That seems more like the dynamic that we're going for, and I, I do think that works really well. Hmm. Never listen to anything Stark says. <laughs> hey, you know, men don't care about such things, and that gets the bonking. Um, and... <laughs> there's so much good cigarette animation. I'm not a cigarette fan, but there is a ton of good cigarette animation from dropping it to the moment when she's patting his head later and it's sort of wobbling around and ashes falling off of it. Just, just a lot of really, really subtle, nice moments. Or there as he puffs and puffs. I'm old enough to let most callousness go, but girls can make the emotions of boys his age swing wildly. You should probably go after him. And you should probably go after him. Hands. Hands. Feet. Hesitation. Stopping. Okay. Let's, let's take that as our opportunity. I could cut in a dozen cuts from episode ones of Naoko Yamada shows, of uh, uh, Kyo Any shows, of Liz and the Bluebird, that have extraordinarily similar interactions. In fact, there's a scene in Liz and the Bluebird that's very similar that has to do with a hesitation that's just like that. Like, ah, and then a reluctance, and then the feet go back down, and it's just right. It's kind of just right. So my question is, who is responsible for the overall production of this episode. So I'm going to go look. A-N-N, free run. We're looking for episode 14, because it's 7 times 2. Storyboard, Shinya Ino. Let's see if it's the same guy directing. Directing, Shinya Ino. And no crossover directors. No crossover directors. Uh, unit director, C-A-D... We can grab Chief Animation Director. Nope, it's all Reiko Nagasawa for all of it, so nothing special there. And then I will look for Animation Directors. Hirotoshi Arai on 14. And that's it. Cool. So this narrows it down quite a bit. We've got Shinya Ino as our storyboard and episode director for episode 14. And we've got uh, Hirot Hirotoshi Arai as our animation director for the episode as well. Okay, Shinya Ino. Director, Dr. Stone. Storyboard, multiple episodes. Okay. Hanebado, one episode. Storyboard, an episode direction. Maiden Abyss, one episode. Storyboard, three episodes. Episode director, overall assistant director. Okay. Review Starlight, one episode. Episode one. Interesting. Nor nine. That's so wild. So there's nothing, nothing here that would lead me to think that there's been any real crossover with Naoko Yamada necessarily, nor is there anything here that jumps out to me as like a highly character animation focused or like emotional expression focused piece of media. Um, maybe with the exception of Review Starlight, which takes a lot of cues, I'd say, from KyoAni shows, but nothing else here. Okay, good job, Shinya Ino. I Interesting. And then for animation director, we have Hirotoshi Arai, who has a much, much longer list. And I'm just going to skim through it and see if I find anything that's not key animation. Because mostly we're seeing, I'm seeing key animation, key animation, key animation. Key animation on Fate's Day Night Heaven's Feel. Key animation on Shokugeki no Soma. Animation director and key animation on Flip Flappers. Hanamonogatari. Kageki Shoujo, which is not Kageki Shoujo Review Starlight. No. Different thing. Okay. Uh, little Buster's Love Live. A little bit of Mushishi. Some Nonon Biori. But it's all key animation. It's all it's all key animation. Couple Monogatari's. So no nothing that would give me an answer. Okay, cool. Cool to know. Something to keep an eye on. Um, keep an eye on these artists and creators here at Toshi Arai. And Shinya Ino, interesting. Man, sucks to be doing something mildly private and have the person that you're doing it for just show up there. I don't like how accustomed you seem to the company of women. Did you find Stark? Clench. But you couldn't talk to him. 
It's not that you don't like him, you just don't understand. Ah, to be young. I like this. Even if you forgot, you've overreacted. He's not that conscientious. You've got to judge people where they're at. You've got to, got to accept people where they're at, right? Like, a person who doesn't gift give, a person who came from a culture that doesn't gift give, whose first ever birthday present was from you, might not know how to engage with that at all. And judging them based on what you understand about the world might not be relevant at all. There's some significant cultural difference here, and it's not made easier by the fact that you're both young adults with weird hormonal systems and all that jazz. Though we're not really bringing that in. Mostly, we're just saying that perhaps this blame levied upon him is not placed properly. I gave him a present, though. Okay, did you choose one with him? Well, yeah. And I don't know what this means. Normally, no one declines when someone offers to buy them whatever they want. You must consider it an important memory. I bought him with the present. Nobody, normally, nobody declines when you offer to buy it. But she did, but then was like, not the gold one. I'm not sure what those lines mean. I, I don't quite understand this. Would you, would anybody care to jump in and express what they think Sign is trying to say here? Because it feels like a cornerstone of his argument that I don't quite get. That's why he said no. So go apologize and pick out a gift with him. He's just a kid. He's slow on the uptake. And most importantly, you do want to make up with him, don't you? People won't know how you feel unless that you tell them. I love this. I love this top to bottom. So let's start. Let's go back to the beginning of it. And we'll start there. He did forget, but you're overreacting. He's not that conscientious. There's a line that I quite like. Um, and, uh, uh. And hold to and I think is very useful and I think all of us would do much better in our interpersonal relationships if we tried actively to remember this one um it's also one that you can use as a defense because it is a genuine defense that's very often the truth and um well I'll just say it again I, I said it before never attribute to malice what can be easily explained by stupidity or ineptitude so Somebody didn't buy you a present. Is it more likely that they didn't buy you a present because they hate you and they don't want to buy you anything? Or maybe that they don't know how to, don't know how to talk to you about it, and are generally inept in this field, in this area? It's probably more likely that they're not a malicious actor trying to cause you harm. Right? Probably? Probably. <laughs> um. So there's something that that frustrates the hell out of me. Frustrates the hell out of me. It feels like, and this isn't actually true, but it feels like it. It feels like every time I get in the shower, somebody starts using the hot water. Somebody in the house starts using the hot water. And, you know, when I, when I go to use the water, I check, I think, and I listen, and I see if I can hear the pipes in the house running to see if somebody's taking a shower. And only then do I turn on the hot water. Is the person who's using the hot water while I'm in the shower more likely to be going, <laughs> he's in the shower. Now I'm going to use the hot water and make a shower miserable. <laughs> or are they more likely wearing headphones and just like, gotta wash the dishes. <laughs> da, da, da. Yeah, probably more likely that one. So then... How might one respond or react or interact in a situation like that? Well, if it's the former and, they're, and I believe that they're like, <laughs> maybe I rush out of the shower with soap in my hair going, what the fuck? Why is it that every fucking time I get it? The ah, ah, you're evil. You're trying to fuck with my debt. Ridiculous, right? Whereas the alternative might be, hey, I've noticed that pretty often it's hard to take a hot water shower in this house because somebody consistently starts using the hot water. I know you're probably not trying to. Can you try to keep an ear out for when somebody's in the shower? It'd be really helpful. One of those is going to work way better than the other and is also more likely to be accurate. And this is true about like almost everything. Almost everything. I think people are just not very good at considering the possible effects of their actions on other people it's something you have to consciously train and that means that the baseline like the default for most people 
is to ignore everybody else because you're stuck in your own self-centered story. So to expect much more of people than that before you've communicated with them, before you've talked to them about whatever it is that's a problem, is probably not great. You're probably expecting more than what most people are going to deliver. Now, that's not to say that sometimes people aren't acting maliciously or horribly or pranking you or being fucked up. I've had plenty of weird interactions with people that are actually awful, and there are Karens who exist, and uh, the, whatever the male version of a Karen is. Um, plenty. Plenty of people who don't have any feelings for other people, have no desire to like support others or be good to them and are just trying to get theirs and get out. But most of the time, it's not like that. And most of the time, if you communicate what's going on, you can overcome the thing and find out that it's most likely not a choice and more likely like a lack in the other person's ability to see what they're doing wrong. I don't know if this necessarily comes back to our conversation at the beginning about being able to see your flaws and recognize them and then even share them with the world, but I think maybe it does. We're not often very conscious of our flaws, and very often, if there's an expectation that somebody has of us and we're not fulfilling it, the reason isn't because we don't want to or refuse to, the reason is because we're not aware that that expectation has been placed on us. If you read Am I the Asshole, A-I-T-A-H, A-I-T-A, Am I the asshole threads on Reddit? It's a, 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 a subreddit where people post posts asking if they're the asshole in some situation. You'll find often that whichever way that the, the writing or the post goes, the person isn't sure if they're doing something wrong and also isn't sure if their expectations towards someone else are wrong. So I get this feeling like... Maybe the first action that you should take in uh, a situation of interpersonal conflict is not to maybe accuse the other person of seeking conflict or whatever, but to just query their expectations and what they think is the norm around an event like this. Like, hey, what do you do for birthdays usually? And in the case of Stark, it's like nothing. The only instance where I've had a birthday that felt like a birthday was last time and it was with you. And so you say, well, okay, you know how that went. I showed you in that case what I expect from birthdays, like a little bit of respect and then maybe the push to get somebody a gift because it's reciprocal. And the other person might go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I didn't really think that through. Or they might do what we do in this episode and go, yeah, I know. I, I know. I just don't know how to deal with it. Like, do I come up and ask you? Isn't that weird? And you go, no, it's not weird. It's fine. And that's what we do in this episode. But if you don't communicate about it, and you just assume that you understand why they're doing the thing, it seems pretty likely that you're going to assume that it's malice, that it's like a choice, when they might be entirely unaware of the possibility of choosing otherwise. You have to introduce that possibility to them, introduce the options that they might have. I, I like that. I think that this points out a, a core fundamental flaw, a thing that happens constantly between people, especially in romantic relationships. And I think and this might be going out of line. I might be out of line here. I think happens really frequently between men and women, specifically with women expecting the man to understand what's going on in their head and not communicating it and expecting the other person to read their mind. This seems so common to me. Um, and it happens the other way, but seemingly less frequently. It seems more frequent that a woman has particular expectations, and the attitude that she'll take is, I shouldn't have to tell you what you're doing wrong. You should just be able to figure it out. And that's garbage. That's garbage. And it's going to lead to terrible relationships, because the other person might not have any capacity to ever consider the thing, like, wouldn't recognize the thing that they're doing wrong until you hit them over the head with it and tell them why it hurts you. I think you could take this example of Fern and Freerun, uh, of Fern and Stark, 
and stare at it for a while and dramatically pr improve all your romantic interactions forever. <laughs> I think it's that good. I think it's that good. It's really cool. He's just a kid. He's slow on the uptake. And I think whether or not Sign actually believes all of this, this is a really good angle for him to explain to Fern, even if it's not entirely true or entirely accurate. Giving Fern this perspective that's like, oh, I have to lead Stark by the hand a little bit. If I've got expectations, I've got to point him in that direction and be kind of explicit about them. Otherwise, they're just not going to happen. And if in her mind that's because he's dumb and doesn't get it, fine. It leads to the same result. The outcome is still that she communicates more clearly what she expects and wants, and that puts the ball actually into Stark's court. What Fern is doing is going, the ball's in your court, and Stark is going, what ball? What game are we playing? I'm on a court? You haven't told me anything. Whereas here, this gets Fern to be like, okay, I gotta, st I gotta set the ground rules and establish what I'm expecting, otherwise he's an idiot and he's not gonna know what to do. Whether it's true or not, it's kind of not. Like, Stark did know what he should do. He understood. They didn't know how to approach it. Still... What Sign says ends up working, and that puts him more into that big brother perspective where he understands a little bit of what's going on and maybe says exactly what's going on or maybe says what each party needs to hear in order to make the situation resolve. He's good at this. And finally, what's more important? And I like how this is phrased, but I would even accept it being phrased more dramatically. Which is more important to you? Being right about this thing or making up with your friend. And I think this is a wrinkle point that all of us could stand to benefit from as well. If something goes on between two people, and you know whether you attribute it to stupidity or malice, whatever, it causes some rift or some conflict, at a certain point you've got to weigh things and realize or discover or determine whether your pride, which is probably the thing that's been wounded here, is worth letting the relationship be ruined. Do you want to make up with that person? If so, maybe humility in the face of that is the way to do so. Very often, going and apologizing to someone is the only way to open the field for them to say what they might say, because they might not come to the same conclusions about their pride or mistakes in a year or two years or whatever. So if you come to the conclusion and you're willing to eat a little bit of humility, and make the first move toward apologizing and making up, very often that seems to open the door for the other person to express what they're actually feeling underneath and how they made a mistake that they've made and maybe to apologize in turn. It can also backfire, and I want to point this out because it's happened to me. Um, I, I am a person who does this. I like to um, to mediate and, and uh, uh, make good of on relationships, I don't like leaving things in conflict. There's um, a particular attachment style that that uh, is associated with, and I forget what it is. Anyway, that's part of my tendency as a person. I, I like to mediate. It likely comes from the fact that my parents split when I was pretty young, and um, so growing up in a broken household, a child is very often uh, uh, structures themselves to be a, a mediator in conflicts, and that can get very deeply rooted, and that's likely what has happened to me. I almost always find myself gravitating toward the center of conflicts and uh, uh, looking for a way to um, to show people that the underlying relationship or friendship is worth more than whatever petty argument they're currently having. I, I often move toward apologies, and I've had it go both ways. Um, I've had situations where, and, and I will I will often go and apologize when I do not think that I'm in the wrong, um, and and. Just to be clear about this, it's it's a, a pride-destroying thing to do, and I think that's a very good thing. Uh, uh, crushing your own ego can be very valuable. It's a pride-destroying pride thing to do, to, to eat humility when you know you haven't done anything wrong. Very often people will go, I didn't do anything wrong, I'm never going to apologize, motherfucker. But it's a waiting thing, it, it, a weight, physical weight. Is the relationship or the friendship worth more than the wounded pride that you're experiencing? If so, if the relationship is worth more, then the humility or humiliation, if you want to see it that way, of going and apologizing for whatever part you can 
you can reasonably like think that's probably what this person thinks I did wrong and then go and legitimately apologize to them and not in a snarky way not like a I'm so sorry that you feel this way none of that garbage right take it go full on toward responsibility for it claim complete responsibility for the thing and apologize to them very often what happens is they go you know what man no the truth is I was out of line and blah 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 for whatever reasons and then you shake hands and everything is good because both of you have owned up to it or whatnot there's an alternative that can happen and it's a really interesting one and that's where the person that you're apologizing to doubles down and is like yeah you were really wrong and how dare you i had this happen with a a, a, a personal trainer at the gym that i was going to um he and i had interacted a, a number of times pleasantly um just bantering and uh uh we bantered at one point and I pointed out something about the the person who was training and her squats. I was like, oh, uh, uh, she's like got a lack of hamstring flexibility. That's why her squat isn't hitting depth. And he went absolutely wildly off on me, like fully went wildly off on me. How dare you? Like, what the fuck, man? And then made some very disparaging comments about my outfit. I, I was wearing relatively tight shorts and I'll admit this. And he, he said something like, I don't usually tend to take advice from people wearing underwear in the gym. I was like, whoa, dramatic, fucking really, really vitriolic, venomous. So I just sort of left that be. And a few days later, I went up to him at the, at the gym counter and I went, hey, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to intrude while you were, while you were coaching somebody. And he doubled down. And he doubled down. He was like, you're right. You absolutely shouldn't have. And it was really fucked up that you did. And you were also wrong about what you said. I was like, okay, all right okay and i learned something really important from that interaction it was that i want nothing to do with that person and the humility or humiliation of going and apologizing to him was meaningless because all it did was make him go mask off and reveal that he's not a great person and not somebody whose opinion i care about so when you take that humility and that sort of humble perspective forward and choose to initiate the the potential bridge rebuilding the potential apologizing and fixing of the problem whatever the other person does after that you can be confident that you have taken the best steps that are that are available to you and not by doing it snarkily right not i didn't i didn't go up to this guy at the gym and be like well now i'm gonna get him right <laughs> make him feel bad by going and apologize i know it's like maybe i can prevent you know, uh, uh, tension from continuing here and uh, go back to maybe casual banter with this person who was casually able to banter with me until suddenly exploding. How weird. Then I find out that the explosion is closer to the reality and it's like, I don't care anymore. Do you want to make up with that person? If so, you can sacrifice just a smidge to get a whole lot out of apologizing to them or going and communicating with them period. I really like this from Sign. It is, again, deeply mature. And finally, people won't know how you feel unless you tell them. Again, people seem to expect each other to be mind readers. We're not mind readers. Rarely, rarely, when someone is doing something that hurts you, are they aware of it. And if you communicate with them and find out that they are aware, with it, aware of it, you know that you need to get out you know that that there's no you know there's no recourse there and so you can sever that tie without feeling terrible about it and if you find out instead that they aren't aware of it and are willing to fix it willing to change their behavior in order to more suit your relationship then you've just strengthened the relationship which wouldn't have happened if you didn't communicate i think there's only good that can come from it only ever <laughs> sorry for kicking you yeah yeah <laughs> Wham! Feet. Hands. Feet. Hold. Nervously look away. Can't make eye contact. She can't even get out the words before he does. Yeah? So where was he actually? It wasn't, I'm not getting you a gift. It was, I didn't want to mess it up. It's really important to me. Right? Totally the opposite. But I thought you'd get upset if I told you that I'm dumb and I don't know what you want because you're always upset with me and your actions toward me don't make sense. And you don't ever really explain to me why you're upset with me. So I can't really fix it. So I'm just kind of guessing. And that guessing game causes me to act less, right? 
that's the, the, the natural tendency. If somebody keeps berating you for everything you do, do less. How many relationships do you see and, and like long-term relationships that end up down that kind of a path? How many beaten down? Uh, so I, I've met a lot of, you know, parents of friends and I've been in a lot of houses there to, again, work on contracting jobs or similar. I've seen a lot of relationships where there is a man glued to the couch, stuck on his football or his game or whatever lets him escape, a woman who runs the house completely and berates him for anything that he does and then yells about how useless he is when he doesn't do anything. How did it get that way? How did it get there? Maybe a pattern like this. Maybe a pattern of, you're useless. God, you can't do anything right. Why is it that you keep fucking everything up? And so he goes, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. Everything I do gets me yelled at. And if I don't do anything, then I'll get yelled at too eventually, but less than if I do do anything. And... I won't have to totally destroy my, my ego and pride because the thing that I did gets totally berated and cut, and cut down and chopped off at the knees by this person who's living with me. Yeah. Yeah, that feels right. And wrong. And wrong. But in the absence of communication, with only disdain coming towards you, and in the absence of either party being really mature enough to be able to recognize what's happening, what are you going to do except separate and shut the fuck down? That's what you're going to do. You're going to shut down. I wouldn't be upset with you, but how would he know that? He would expect her to be upset with him. So instead, they have to communicate. They both have to eat a little bit of humility. He's surprised by her apology, and she's surprised by his. And they both realize that the mask that they've been sort of clashing with isn't the person underneath at all. So, let's go. Let's go find something fun and nice. And so they do. Sneaking and watching. Pretty cool. You understand relationships better once you're older. You start avoiding conflict then. I don't know about that. I think I understand what sign means, but, uh, and, and in context, I agree, but I, I want to disagree with this, you start avoiding conflict when you're older part. I think, first of all, you start ha stop having as many conflicts because you've accumulated enough of these instances of communication and, and experience where you can recognize the circumstance more effectively. But I think avoiding conflict is an indicator of some degree of immaturity. I think that actively engaging in the proper way with the right conflicts is the indicator of maturity. Choosing your battles, perhaps, would be a way of putting it, but also the way you battle is a big indicator of maturity. I think immature relationships very often stake the relationship on the battle, and that's never the, the way that a mature relationship functions, right? It, a common cliche would be, you versus me versus us versus the problem. But I think that's accurate. Once you get that communication line underway and that mature communication is part of your repertoire, I don't think you start avoiding conflicts. I think you start finding the conflicts and being willing to address them before they explode, before they become a giant dragon that you have to deal with. But I think it works here. Privilege of the young. Looking after two kids sounds tough. And then, what do you mean by understanding relationships? Oh, right. I forgot who I was talking to. Three kids. So why do you think Fern asked uh, uh, Sign for advice instead of free run? Two reasons. One, you remind her of Height or who she trusts. Two, Fern knows that free run doesn't know this. Right? Fern knows that free run is a dork with the freaking... Uh, uh, clothes dissolving goop and and see through uh, spells and shit. Fern's not gonna go to Free Ren for serious advice. And I gotta see this again because it's the cutest, cutest fucking thing in the episode. Wee! How how many memes? And the little th 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 as she goes down the tiles too. <laughs> That's cool. Funny that this village has Spanish tile. So so curved Spanish tile. 
like S curved uh, clay tiles would have uh, been introduced to the region by the Moors in in 711 CE, but they were produced long before that. Wow, so th those have been those have existed for a long, long time. That's cool. I'd hardly call him great. In reality, he was a fool. A liar. A corrupt priest. But you, you're even worse. That's weird. Because I remember him differently. I remember him as kind and dependable. An ideal grown-up. So we come here. You've matured. Well, it's just natural. That's the way it happens with people. And then he expresses something that seems to be as true as, as true as true can be. Um, talk to older folks. Talk to older folks, because you're going to be one of them. Let's, let's get this clear. None of us last forever. And you certainly don't last forever as you are. So get prepared for what you're going to experience. When you see old people, I think most of us think that what's inside matches what's on the outside. There's a really easy way to dispense with that idea, to, to remove that illusion from yourself, and that's just to communicate with older folks. Um, got some friends who are in their 80s who are neighbors. Got a number of older folk friends. They're as horny and perverted and silly and childish and weird as any child. Perhaps more so. Perhaps those that have really matured are even more in tune with their childish nature than adulty adults who are stuck on their ego in some way. But there's a through line, and I've heard it many, many times. People not feeling their age. Feeling like they are still a 16 or 20 year old, as sharp as could be, just inside a decaying husk, stuck inside it. So, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend remembering that when you interact with older folks. Because very often, the person who's inside is just trapped in an aging cage. And you can really light up their day or their life by playing with them as though they're your age. Or maybe even younger, more childish. Because that, that aspect of them is absolutely there, as deep as in anyone else, and so very rarely gets, gets seen, gets um, interacted with. The, <laughs> the frequency with which old ladies will flirt with you <laughs> is really funny. It's really funny, and very fun, and um, way less serious than than people who are still serious about shit. Old people are great. And very often they are children pretending to be adults who have never stopped pretending. And it's important, and we're going to bring it back to the very first conversation. I was talking in the very first conversation about keeping up a mask of goodness, but what about the mask of of maturity? The mask of of capability and the sort of mm, unshakable solidity that many adults seem to view as mature. I think that's as much of a mask as the mask of being good. And I think it's it similarly shuts down the childish, creative, uh, uh, interesting, and pleasant parts. The truth is my mind has hardly changed. I've simply been pretending until I can make it as an ideal grown-up. And I'll probably keep pretending until the day I die. So we look up, and we're looking down on him. Old staff. Old man, huddled up, telling us that he is just a child pretending to be wise. So he doesn't take himself too seriously. He's aware of his flaws and wears them on the outside. 
engages with them wholeheartedly even, the way a child will at play. And yet his real actions come across to those people who have met and interacted with him. Not Free Ren, she doesn't understand people, but to everyone else who he's interacted with. Fern, Sign, and the church itself, right? As being quite capable, very mature, very intelligent, very wise, a good old man, right? Pretending to be an ideal grown-up, but he's not really pretending that hard, is he? And finally, there's no explanation of this line, not really. I'll keep pretending until the day I die. Children need grown-ups for emotional support. Fern, in particular, needs lots of praise and guidance. So what does this mean in context? To me, this means part of the reason that I pretend is because other people need that image, that symbol in their lives. Fern needs uh, a mature adult to guide her, and so I act the role. I play the part. Sign and the others in the church need mature elders to look up to and to guide them, and so I play that part despite being a child on the inside, despite not necessarily trusting myself completely. I still play that part. And then, Free Ren questions it, who will praise you for your pretending, for your sacrifice? And of course, that's what the goddess is for. And this comes to original theories about the, the, the origins of gods in the first place. Psychologically, one of the explanations for the human tendency to create gods is that we grow up with parents, with adults, with somebody bigger and smarter and stronger than us to lead us on a direction and to guide our path. And one day, you get to a point where you realize that your parents, the adults around you, aren't really much different from you. They're just bigger and older. <laughs> They've, they're still children on the inside, too. And their guidance ce ceases to have that, that holiness to it, that sanctity. It's no longer a guarantee that what your parent tells you is the gospel truth. So you look somewhere higher for something else to follow and, well, create an ideal, an image that represents what you think a mature person might be and then strive to emulate that ideal just as you emulated your parents before, or not, strive to emulate the ideal that you've created in the image of your own parents, of your own adults, of your own gods to you as a child. That's what the goddess is for, to be a guiding light for those of us who know that adults are kind of just pretending. Maybe there's something transcendent and ideal beyond that, something that isn't flawed at its core. And that's, that's exactly it. Through the platonic ideals, um, understanding that the things that are represented in reality are not their ideal selves, not the forms that they actually, that they represent. Extrapolating that out to people, seeing the, painting the ideal form of person, and then putting that up above everything else and striving for it. And then there's this. We don't engage with whether Freeman herself is humble or honorable or honest or godly or a child playing at being an adult. We know she's a child playing at, as, at being an adult as show watchers. But what she does is praise him here. In the absence of that thing that children need, and in the recognition that this old man is a child in a, uh, a decaying skin, if children need it and he is a child, then he needs it, and you can give it to him. Highest quality head pat ever put to screen, maybe. I don't know. Magically sweet and cute. And indeed, you should be praised as well. I love this. I, I love it. Few women are older than me. <laughs> ah, 
And that takes us to the midpoint of the episode, and we can speed things up from here, I think. The ring has deep meaning. Deep meaning! It's all, it means eternal love. This bird is dope. Bird monster, awesome. God, that horse had a bad fucking day. How did he how did it even stay attached? I'm not sure. Finding out about learning the wind the the flying magic and finding out that because we adapted adapted it, we haven't been able to like improve it very much. Really interesting and flies in the face of it because she has adapted qual and turned that into a demon killing magic, which is pretty interesting. You can jump. I'll fly. Apparently Ison was immortal, just a brick. Um and the whole the whole concept is really cool. The flying, the having to figure it out, and eventually this dope ass action sequence. Yum. Really rad. I love the foreshortening here. Big qual blast. Just chooses some really some really potent angles for the whole thing. I really like it. And drops everything except the horse. Aw. This gives us a great excuse to stay in the area for a little while. And a pressure to have to leave whether we find the ring or not. By the way, that bracelet has specific meaning. Glad I did since she liked it. Yeah. By the way, it means a lot. Should I buy you a replacement? It's not like I want to tell you that I love you or anything. No. No, this is mine now. <laughs> your, your heart is mine. Cute. Fucking ridiculous. So how does he, he just bonks it on the head? He doesn't chop it? Okay. They eat the whole boar. They ate the whole boar. It's a lot of meat. I love free run as a blanket. I think it's great. I love how understated we're able to make this. We know why she's out here looking. But we don't have to say any of it. And the whole thing, we get like time passing very clearly as they repair the carriage and, and, and push through. It's just a couple days. And finally... Yeah, it doesn't matter. I doubt Hemel knew what it meant. God damn it. He knew. He fucking knew. This guy has the most coolestest spell. Finding lost accessories. God damn it. The key finding spell. She goes up and it's as magically potent as any magic we've seen in free run work. Even though it's just a mundane spell. This really does matter. I love that she picks it out without understanding it, and then Hemel chooses it because he does understand it. Ooh, baby. Shipper is going wild. You don't have to you don't have to look very far to see that Hemel got on his fucking knees for free ren and put a ring on that finger. That That is a stage beyond romantic. Yeah, she's glad. And we all write. Overall, I really like the themes of this episode. All, all throughout. From the way it engages with um, interpersonal conflict to the way it sort of plays off of our conversation about gift giving and communicating about gift giving. Um, the first time, I think I was pretty clear about my perspective on that and how I, I think you really need to communicate it. And it's, it's a very good idea to do so. Here we get a situation where they're not communicating at all, and it goes really wildly bad until they do, and then it is magically solved, as though human beings can solve almost all of our problems by talking honestly with each other. I like that as a theme of free run all the way through. Another another banger of an episode. What can I say? Free run good. Free run good. Show good. Themes good. Ideas good. Animation cool. <laughs> Love it. Thanks so much for watching this week's episode of Soul Soul No Freedom. Hope to see you next week when we dive a little bit further and move forward into episode 15. Much love. Peace.